Hi, welcome back to Thrive Live. Now let's bring on Jason Walker, partner for Thrive HR Consulting, to tell us about today's guest. Hi, Hi Beth. Jason, welcome. Greetings from uh, Austin, Texas today. <laughs> Hope you're Greetings well. Greetings from Katy, Texas. <laughs> well, we're super lucky to have a really great guest for Thrive Live today, and that's Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Um, Glenn was elected as the 36th Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts in November of 2014. And Glenn is considered the Chief Financial Officer of the state of Texas, which is the 10th largest economy in the world. Um, he's responsible for being the state's treasurer, uh, getting the checks written, the tax collector, the procurement officer, and the revenue estimator. Um, Glenn graduate graduated uh, in 1983 from Texas A&M University um, and a graduate of St. Mary's University where he earned a Master's of Arts and his law degree at the University of Arkansas. Um, and he earned his Master's of Law. And Glenn is actually one of the nicest people you will ever meet in your entire life. I've known Glenn for you know a few years now and I think super highly of him. And um, we're really excited to have Glenn come on and talk to us about what's going on um, with the economy and how things are going in the, the state of Texas. So welcome, Glenn. Thank you, Jason. It's great to be with you. Good to see you again. Wish we were being able to do this across from each other just in person, but so is the days of the pandemic and being a lot of virtual live. It's uh, really good to be with you all today. Let me uh, just kind of backtrack a little bit to uh, February of this year, kind of state of where the economy was here in Texas. As you mentioned, in the controller's office, we have a wide range of responsibilities. Three of the main constitutional responsibilities is running the state treasury. Uh, roughly, Texas is the ninth largest economy in the entire world. And uh, that means that we have a state budget of roughly about $125 billion a year. So we make sure that all those checks are issued, all the accounting is taken care of. You also mentioned that I'm the uh, tax collector here in the state of Texas. And then third constitutional duty is we constantly monitor the state economy. So therefore we can tell the legislature how much money will come into the state treasury for our two year budget cycle. And if adjustments need to be made between each legislative session in odd given years, then we'll make those adjustments either upwards or downwards as we're watching the economy because Texas has to have a balanced budget. So we have to live within our means. So in looking at Texas back in February, we had a very strong economy. Texas has traditionally outpaced the national average in economic growth year after year. We've had strong job gains. Uh, just in the month of February alone, we had over 50,000 job gains here in the state of Texas. We had in the last 12 months up to that point, roughly over 300,000 job gains. In the last 10 years, it's been about 2.5 million, which is really about a quarter of the job creation of the entire nation here in the U.S. So the state economy had been doing very well. We were tracking a little bit ahead of our revenues that we had anticipated to come in the state treasury. And then obviously everything drastically changed in March of this year. For Texas, it's a, a dual headwind. And what I mean by that is first, we had lower oil prices because Russia and Saudi Arabia couldn't agree to OPEC cuts and to make it even worse, Saudi Arabia decided they were gonna increase production. And at one of the worst times as we were unfortunately now know we were entering into a global pandemic with the coronavirus. And so with those two dual headwinds, I immediately wanted to start scripting out to legislative leadership, as well as the governor, as well as the public, that we didn't know how wide, how deep, but we knew that Texas was undoubtedly unfortunately going to start entering into some type of recession. Now, as you know, we had so many businesses that were closed as people were social distancing, government mandated shutdowns, not just here in Texas, not just in the United States, but around the world. Texas is 19% of all of the exports out of the United States, the number one exporter state in the nation. So therefore, we're very tied to international economy. And so I wanted to get a few months of data collection in. So we could start seeing a trend of what we thought were going to happen. We looked back at past downturns, past recessions. We knew this one was going to be very unique, nothing that we had ever experienced before, because never does a business have in their plan they're going to be shut down for a few days, much less for several weeks. So several different industries obviously have been very much impacted by this. Unfortunately, a tremendous number of people have lost their jobs, not just here in Texas, but in the United States and around the world. And so as we were watching economic indicators, my staff looked at a lot of non-traditional economic indicators because typically we look at sales tax collections, which obviously kind of lag and it takes a while for there to be sometimes uh, impact. 
And then overall, we started looking at number of people that would fly <clears throat> in our airports every single day because that had reduced our hotel occupancy stays, people going to box office, restaurants, all types of non-traditional economic indicators. And so I wanted to wait a few months to get a revi revision to our revenue estimate, how much money we thought would come in the treasury. And so we released that in July of earlier this year. So we're constantly monitoring the economy, but I figured, hey, maybe I'll just uh, stop there. And I know you got some questions. Maybe we'll go through the question and answer. And so I think some of the things that I was gonna talk about were probably covered in the Q&A portion. So I just thought maybe we'll move into that, Jason, if you don't mind. Sure, that's great. As you mentioned on July 20th, you released that. Um, revised um, revenue estimate. Do you know when you're going to provide your next official update? Yeah, so I'm constitutionally required to give an update the day before a legislative session and here in Texas, that is the second Monday of January is when I release that. So I will officially update no matter what a brand new revenue estimate, but that will be for the next two year budget cycle. It'll also make some adjustments to this one. Uh, now, obviously there's lots of uncertainty as to the to any revenue estimate when it's an economy of this size. And right now, we always make the point that there's, there's revenue estimates are clouded with uncertainty. The one today is clouded with more uncertainty than ever before because of yeah. all the assumptions we're trying to make, not just here in Texas, the US, but worldwide, what governments and individuals and businesses are doing. And so the point being is that July when we release, we're gonna continue to monitor the economy if adjustments need to be made to that one, we will later this fall, but we know for sure that I'll release a new one come January of next year if we think the current one, all the assumptions we made, continue to hold, hopefully hold true. Okay. Have you been surprised by the month to month changes and how impactful those have been in shaping your long-term views on the economy and the revenues? Yeah, there's several different things that have been uh, you know, very, very unique about this event, we had record drops there in the month of March and the month of April as businesses were shut down. Not just a contraction in our GDP, contraction unfortunately in employment as unemployment numbers, our revenues into the treasury, some of the revenues literally dropped by 40, 50, 60%, which are historical drops. Typically in a recession, it takes about a six month lag, but this one was very different because so many businesses were shut down and people moving to working at home when they're capable of. So one of the other things that has been surprising, we've seen a trend in online purchases continue to increase over the course of time as individuals transition to online purchasing versus going to brick and mortar stores. However, the pandemic has absolutely accelerated that. And so one of the things that we did in our revised revenue estimate is we upward revised significantly how much money we thought was gonna come in the treasury from sales tax based on online sales. And so we'd originally estimated about half a billion and now we've increased that to almost $1.5 billion because so many more people are buying online versus going to brick and mortar stores. Absolutely. Um, Glenn, do you foresee additional stimulus coming out of DC? Yeah, right now, you know, Congress, both the House, the Senate and the administration are, are working on something. We feel as though something will be coming out, but there's disagreement as to what that will be, whether one additional unemployment benefits, the federal government gave additional unemployment benefits to those that were, were unemployed. Those expired at the end of July. The president, through authority and executive order, gave additional benefits of dollars that were appropriated for the White House, so he was able to move those over. So there's disagreement as to what the level is going to be. So that is one issue, whether there's additional stimulus dollars going to people of a certain income bracket and below, that's a point of disagreement, as well as whether there should be additional dollars going to state and local government. And then lastly, the state of Texas, for example, has received money for a wide variety of different things, whether it's public education, higher education, social services, and also a block amount of money for COVID type expenses. But those COVID expenses have to be spent specifically within some parameters. So many states, especially those that are not as in good a cash financial standpoint as Texas, have been uh, trying to ask their congressional delegations to loosen those parameters so they can use it for a wider amount of purposes. And so well, that's the fourth thing that we don't know. So we feel very confident something will be passed, but we don't know exactly what mix that is gonna be because negotiations seem to have been stalled for the last couple of weeks. 
Um, Glenn, you recently met with the rating, rating agencies that provided Texas state and local credit ratings. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process and what were their concerns and do they still consider Texas to be a good investment? Well, the good, good news is, first and foremost, of the four credit rating firms that, that we visited with and rated Texas, Texas is still has the highest credit rating that we're able to possibly get um, recognized as, as AAA credit rating. So we're Yay. very pleased with that. Yeah, we A once again. Now, some of the questions really more has to do with the next legislative session. So the borrowing, just real quick, Texas goes and borrows money every single year because in September, October, and November, the first three months of our fiscal year, so we're on a fiscal year starting September 1, we send the public school districts about 50% of the money that they would normally get from the state of Texas. And so therefore, what that means is in December, Texas, we have a mismatch of revenues going out and revenues coming in. So we typically go borrow money, and we've done that for over 30 years, where we borrow and front load the school district's money. So that way the school districts don't have to go borrow, the state can go borrow as one. So typically we borrow a very large sum of money, 7.2 billion, and I didn't stutter, billion dollars to be able to send those dollars to the public school system. And so the credit rating agencies right now in this fiscal year, Texas is standing in a strong fiscal position compared to many other states and many other nations dealing with the pandemic. But with that being said, they're also looking out into the future as when the legislature gets into next session, what is the budget situation going to look like then? What are some of the issues that we're dealing with and how are we handling the pandemic? You know, the question just two months ago was whether COVID was going to be here during the summer. Well, now we know it is not going to go away and it's something that we're going to have to deal with and learn to live with for until, you know, some solution, a vaccine is possibly found. And so questions around types of issues is that. And then uh, lastly, we've made a significant commitment to public education in the last legislative session. A lot of questions resolved around that, but all the four credit rating agencies see Texas still as a very strong uh, borrower for credit, and that's why we continue to maintain our AAA status. Well, that's great news. Thank you for all your fantastic work and your team's fantastic work to, to continue to make that happen for Texas, so thank you so much. Um, how has the drop in oil prices impacted the economy and revenues, and will that make things worse for Texas? And will transportation, highway, and other critical infrastructure funding be hit? Yeah, really good question. If you look at all of the energy producing states here in the nation, you know, going back real quick to the credit rating, <clears throat> when we had a downturn in the oil and gas industry just in 2015 and 2016, not too many years ago, in the last downturn, uh, in fact, most of the other states got a downgrade in their credit rating, but Texas did not because Texas is a much more diverse economy than we were in the 1980s and a very diverse economy, but obviously the downturn does impact the state treasury. It does impact some regions of the state more than others. Obviously out, out in the Permian Basin, the Midland Odessa area is much more substantially impacted because that is primarily, that is the main driver of the economy in the Permian Basin. The Houston area has a much higher concentration of oil and gas companies than other communities here in the state of Texas. So Houston has a little bit more of a, a drag on the economy during a downturn in oil and gas prices. And so we had been watching the oil and gas industry already because we had seen a little softening of sales tax that would come into the state treasury from the mining industry, oil and gas that is. And part of that was because borrowing from banks and private equity was getting a little bit more difficult for them for a variety of reasons. But obviously with a rapid deterioration in prices, and even back in April, at one point for the first time in history, the uh, the trading of oil, which was for that for that month, which was closing out the next day, actually went negative. And so we had never seen that in our history. In fact, I was having lunch with my three kids here at our house because they were being schooled at home. Uh, school, public school system was closed. And uh, they, they several times were asking me through the day, what was the negative oil price? Because they couldn't even comprehend. How do you actually pay somebody to take your oil. And so we had a very <laughs> significant disruption in the market. Prices have gone back up in the low 40s, but we think it's going to stay there for quite some time. And I give an example. A, if you go, remember I said earlier, up we track over how many people fly in our U.S. airports every single day. Typically on average, I didn't know this until, until the pandemic, but we usually have about 2.3 million people fly in the United States on a given day on average. And at the peak of the downturn, when no one was flying, we went all the way down to 90,000 people. 
Now it's back to 800,000, but 800,000 is only a third compared to what it used to be. And so I use that as an example to make the point that's less demand that is out there, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide, and less demand as people are moving about. And so that's, that significant disruption has hit the state treasury and will continue to hit. Fortunately, most of our severance tax collections from oil and gas that is pulled out of the ground, that goes into our state savings account, or some of it also goes over to fund public transportation. So some of the other states that got downgraded, their issue is they use it to fund basic elements of government where Texas does it a little bit different. So we're a little insulated is my point. Uh, during those downturns, it, it hurts the treasury. But fortunately, we have a state savings account balance uh, at the end of next year, at the end of August, when we close out this two year, we'll have almost $9 billion in that fund. And so that's a nice tool in the toolbox for the legislature to deal with the downturn in the economy that we're having. And so obviously less money going into public transportation and or our state savings account is not a good thing, uh, as well as decrease in sales tax. But, you know, the fact is uh, we entered this in a stronger position than many other states. And that's why I'm glad that I get to do my job in Texas and not some other state. Uh, absolutely. The state of Texas is, is doing a great job. What other challenges will lawmakers um, face when they come back in January, do you think? So one of the, the biggest issue that's facing us is in the current two year budget, the state portion of the money, our state budget is roughly about a third federal dollars, two thirds state dollars. And then of the state dollar portion, there's a portion of it that we call general related revenue, which is the portion that essentially they fairly somewhat have discretion over, um, even though most of it's public education and, and, and health and human services or Medicaid. But the point is that portion alone if you look at, we went from having a $3 billion surplus in our current two-year budget to now we have a deficit of what the legislature appropriated of about $4.5 billion. State leadership has told state agencies to reduce our expenditures. And so therefore, those dollars will be saved in the treasury, but they won't actually get recognized on paper until the legislature comes back into session and takes action to capture those savings. And so that'll reduce it to about $3.5 billion. So the biggest issue is if revenues do not increase, the economy expand beyond what we have assumed in our latest revision, then therefore they're going to have to fill that hole. And whether that's additional cuts and or using some of our state savings account, whether that's greater flexibility from the federal government and the dollars that we've received. So that'll be the biggest issue they're going to have to deal with. And then second is typically during the uh, first year of, of a new decade in 2021, the legislature will have to deal with redistricting. So the state house, the state senate, congressional seats in Texas is poised to get another three to four congressional seats. And so therefore that will be the biggest challenge, assuming as long as we get the census data on time, which typically we get it, the final numbers at the beginning of April. But obviously with the pandemic, the question is whether the Census Bureau will be able to get those numbers to us. Well, he was here. He was here knocking at my door, so I know they're working on it. <laughs> uh, what kinds of uh, information can business leaders provide you to help navigate your efforts to reopen the economy and estimate future economic activity? Yeah, that's a really great question. Obviously, I talk to business owners quite frequently of their very different industry sectors, but now more than ever, because as I mentioned earlier, the data kind of lags that we look at to forecast what the economy is going to do. And right now there's so much uncertainty and disruptions going on. So in other words, again, like I was mentioning, online sellers have done better during this time. Brick and mortar stores have had a harder time, obviously bars or restaurants, those in the, in the hospitality and leisure areas for vacation have had a harder time, but then other businesses have actually done really well. And so trying to be able to understand much quicker what's going on, that information from businesses. One of the things that I like to look at is the comments that individuals provide the uh, Fed there, the Dallas Fed, when they do their monthly surveys for either the retail sector, service sector, manufacturing. I like to read those comments, even though it's a snapshot in time, it tells me a little bit more of what businesses think and even breaking down a different portion of those industry sectors. So point is feedback. I also think right now, is a really good time for the state of Texas and governments to reevaluate 
the regulations upon which businesses have to adhere because some business practices have changed and will always be changed now as a result of the pandemic, the way we do business. And I think we're really poised as an opportunity to hopefully give businesses and, and additional tools in the toolbox with reevaluating some of those regulations. And I think that information is really, really critical right now as well. well that's great. One of the things that I'm really um, driven to is being optimistic. What kind of optimistic statements can you give to people out there uh, in the state of Texas to help them as they navigate through economic uncertainty and through the COVID uncertainty? Yeah, I think first and foremost, the Texans are a very tough group of people. We've been through many downturns okay. before, and people certainly want to be able to be out in the economy, having a job, provide for their families, or if they're a business owner, to be able to get out and create jobs for others. I was on a call earlier with a group of an industry sector and business owners, and, and they've had a hard time, a very difficult time with some of the shutdowns. And what they continually talk about is they want to get out and do their job. You know, some of them were able to use some of the uh, federal dollars that were able to incentivize them to keep their employees. And many of them said, you know, we don't want another government handout. We want to get to work. We want to do what we have been doing and creating jobs. And so I know that, you know, that attitude is number one. And I think Texans really are exemplary in, 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 in striving to have a better economy here. We entered into this downturn on a much stronger footing. In many other states, I get on a call with some of my colleagues around the nation, other treasurers, and let me just say it's real clear. I'd rather do my job here, as I said earlier, than their job because our economy started on a strong foundation. And so I think, you know, a lot of those, we have a lower cost of living than many other states. We don't have a state income tax. We have, a, you know, a better regulatory climate. And so we still think that every day when you wake up, on average, there has been in the past and it'll continue. There's about another 1,000 to 1,200 people in Texas every day. That's hard to imagine. Half of that is <laughs> growth, and then half of that are people that move here. And, you know, my family moved here in the 1840s, and people ask me, why do people move to Texas? And I said, it's the same reason my family moved here in the 1840s. People move here for an economic opportunity, and Texas is still a great state for that economic opportunity. And I think those are some of the reasons that we should be very hopeful that, you know, we're going to be able to weather this storm better than other states. But I think that also means any time that we can try to help our neighbors, help our friends, help those that we go to church with, because people, there are a certain subset of people that are struggling and, you know, trying to be able to look through their eyes and walk in their shoes and, and lend a helping hand, I think is more critical than ever before. Well, we moved here 10 years ago and we found that it's been a fa fantastic place and it's been a great place for us to be economically successful. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to um, tell folks before we let you get out of here and talk and continue working on the very important things that you do for the state of Texas? Well, I just want to say one, thank you for letting me have the time to come on today. It's always good to be with you again. And thank you for all the listeners. And if there's questions that y'all have, please reach out to our office. You know, me and my team, we're all about customer service. We want to do what we need to, to get people's questions answered, help businesses get back going in the right direction those that are being positive and, and and you know able to meet the challenges those that are having bigger hurdles and trying to figure out how to meet those challenges so just you know let us know how we can help because we definitely want to make sure the Texas economy is going in the right direction thank you comptroller thank you. we really appreciate it and thank you for all your fantastic work you're um, a credit to everything that you do and a credit to the state of Texas so thank you so much good to be with you thanks Jason, what a fantastic guest. Thank you so much. That was a great yeah, that was, interview. That was excellent. Thank you so much. That was great, Glenn. That was awesome. Absolutely. Well, um, I look forward to seeing you soon, Jason. We've got a lot more, lot more uh, to share with our viewers. So looking forward to the next interview. All right. Thanks, Beth. I really Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.